Woke up at six o'clock in the morning, chilling with coffee mugs, me and coffee chugs, talking education all across the nation, pushing boundaries, thinking innovation. Chaos. Hello, everyone. How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Living on the Edge of Chaos podcast. Man, I'm really, really, really excited for this conversation on a lot of levels. One, this is somebody who has had huge impacts on work that I've been able to do in classrooms, and I've seen her work directly impact uh, the the thinking, um, the depth of understanding the world, and even the the, the independent uh, minds of, of students and teachers as uh, this guest here has helped on on some really cool classroom projects where we've, we've published some some graphic novels and just her perspective to help us think through things that quite frankly not being in the industry we would have no idea how to even think through that I also highly respect this individual for just in general, her, her thoughts that she brings even outside of the projects and her willingness to to share and help and um, and just humanity in general. And, and we get to do this from while she's across the pond. And so today I'm here uh, with my, my friend Claire, who we haven't had a chance to talk in quite some time since the last time we've been able to connect on a, on a, on a classroom project. But we're here not just to talk education, but I think something that, that's really important as we start to grapple AI, maybe not always AI, but AI is a hot ticket item, thinking about creativity and humanity. And so I'm already getting ahead of myself as we were talking before the show, and I'm already assuming that everyone knows this. So Claire, before we get into the fun, let's start off with letting people know who you are. So Claire, who are you? What do you do? And what in the world do you got going on? Um, well, I'm, I'm Claire Napier. Um, I have kind of a three-prong practice um i'm i, I began, began as a, a comics critic um i became a comics editor and um, I, i'm also a cartoonist um because who can resist um so yeah the the way that i know aaron is um as he said he invited me to be involved in a, some classroom projects that he had going um i've done that for the past two years and it's brilliant it's really good fun it's great to have you know, real life impact on <laughs> on real living, <laughs> real right. living people. Um, most of the time, I I work at home on my own. So though I am working directly with creators, with people making their own comics, um, it's nice to to branch out and to reach you know a little more of humanity. It's always yeah. a goal with um with with comics at large. I mean, comics comics are a communication item. They're they're art, but they're also talk they're mm. reaching out and trying to reach somebody else um so being able to do that through the work and also in the immediate sense is lovely it is and so you know before we get into talking about the creatives and and what that means you know i've, I've been asking a guest just as you can see my backdrop here all my my little spider-man figurines and lego builds <laughs> you know i'm i am a comic um got, a comic nerd. I'm not going to say I'm an expert because there are people that are way beyond my intelligence as I've been getting involved in it the last couple of years. But I am curious about kind of your your origin story, taking the uh, the, the, the comic approach here. And so you work <laughs> in the in, in the comic industry as an editor, as a critic, and all the different hats you wear. So mm -hmm. let's maybe start there. Like, how did you get to this world? How did you know like this is where? I don't know if it's your your path, I'm assuming it is. It's 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 the work you yeah. do. I see what you follow and, and see what you share and I, I can feel that energy. Um uh, but talk a little bit about how you got in there because not everybody gets to live uh a world of comics and maybe some people haven't even held a comic in their hands. So there there's that too. And so I just I want to set the stage for that because what I love about the podcast is bring in so many different perspectives and mm. you have a uh what I love is you've been able to see the impact in the classroom. But you're doing it kind of, even though you are an educator uh, through that lens, but also on the outside, like not directly involved in schools. And so mm. how did you, you, you fall into the pathway of, of, of comics? Well, 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 um, <laughs> to begin, to begin at the beginning, um, actually, no, I'm going to, I'm going to answer something else that you said um, in there while you were speaking. Um, you said that maybe some people haven't held a comic in their hands. I think that's probably wrong. 
I think that, I mean, it, they may not have held an American monthly, um, like, 9 by 11 inch single issue comic. That's probably fair to say many people haven't, because you sure. have to go these days to a speciality shop if you do it on purpose. Um, although I, I believe they are coming back to, like, the supermarkets here and there. But anyway, but everybody's probably held a newspaper. Mm. Um, whether or not it's like a, a big broadsheet or a tabloid or just like a local weekly, there's usually going to be a comic strip in there. Um, I think everyone probably is familiar with the format of comics, whether it's very, very short or long. I mean, even if they don't have a syndicated strip like um, Peanuts, for example, or we have Nemi here, um, or um, Flash Gordon, Prince Valley, and there's there's so many different syndicated strips that a lot of people recognize. Even if the paper that you're holding doesn't have one of those, they probably will have a political cartoon or two, which is just a one panel comic. So I think that everyone recognizes comics, but not everyone recognizes themselves as a comics reader. Um, like people in my own family will say to me, I don't know how to read comics. And to some degree, I'm sympathetic to that because when you think that you don't know how to do something, doing it is intimidating. But it's really just it's just a matter of trying and not assuming that you can't do it, uh, which is <laughs> it's true of basically anything. Like learning how to do something is just a matter of not being afraid to have a go. Um, but no, okay, to answer the actual question. <laughs> well, I love um, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just think it's already like this is why I love talking to you, that shifting of perspective as you answer <laughs> that. I'm like, yeah, you're right. People have, because I was thinking of the tangible comic, you know, yeah. as I, I found my local comic shop and, you know, I've got, I've learned, I've, I've got a pull list. I feel so, so special, <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that's what I'm thinking, but you're still yeah. spot on. And like, yeah, yes, we all, yeah, we have, we have. So yeah. I'm already excited that uh, we're having this conversation. But that's yeah, great. Ahead. Okay. Now um, so, origin story here. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was a child, like a full on small human being, um, I, well, actually, okay, once I was ill and my mum was ill at the same time and my dad came home one day and he brought Cosmopolitan for my mum and he brought a magazine for me as well. He brought me Bunty, um, which was in Britain in the last century now. <laughs> um, it was very, very common to have weekly comics magazines for the children, like the Beano, the Dandy. Um, 2000 AD, the only one really that's left still going. The, the Phoenix has come back, but that wasn't an old one. Um, and Bunty was one of the ones for girls. There used to be many, many, many different titles. There was Ginty, there was Misty, there was Patches and Blue Jeans and My Guy. Like These were magazines that had a lot of comics in to a greater or a lesser degree. Like They, they, they were... It, it wasn't the, the kind of being a comics reader that we think of today looking at the American US market, where you go in every month and you get one whole issue of one whole story. Um, it was usually between one and six pages, like a chapter essentially every week of various different strips. There might be a lot of strips and then one or two other features like the letters page and a quiz and a poster. Or it might be the kind of magazine where it's mostly magazine content and then one or two comic strips. Um, it varied a lot, but in that way, pretty much everyone grew up being a comics reader. It's just that because they weren't categorized as comics per se, it was just something in the magazine. Um, almost no one here thinks of themselves as a comics reader in the same way that we've just been talking about. Um, so even though I read Bunty for quite a lot of years and also read comics in the other um, like young girls' magazines, I was reading like Girl Talk, um, which had a, a Sweet Valley Twins photo mm -hmm. story. I forgot about it as soon as um, as soon as I was aging out of those magazines. I did because I didn't think I've been reading comics. I just thought I've been reading things for children, and now I'm a bit older and I want to read things for teenagers. Um, so there was a gap in my in my readership. Um, and then when I was old enough to go online on my own, I found people who cared about the X Men which I watched on the television as a child. I didn't associate that with comics either because to me it was a cartoon and I didn't have any reason to think of those as even related to each other. Sure. Um, but they were interested in the X-Men comic books. Um, so I sort of discovered that this was a thing that existed, the American format, the, the monthly format. Um, and I found a local shop 
in my local town, the, a speciality shop, a comic shop, where I could get a hold of those American comic books. So I started reading again when I was about 15. Um, and the combination of being online, reading comic books, you can't really be involved in um, fan spaces online without writing. Again, this is probably usually something that we don't think of as writing because it's just talking to people, but it is writing. And through through that, I developed um, much more, in fact, than I did through my school English lessons, the ability to write analysis and to analyze a text and to think about like inference and um, just a critical vocabulary and a critical mind and the... Um, the opinion that it was fun to be critical and interested in the literary object, a comic book. So I met a lot of people just like making friends on online communities, communicating in this fashion. And eventually that led to um, comics.com, which some of us came together to, to form. Um, because at the time, a lot of the, uh, the commentary, the discourse was dominated by not women and um it was quite a hostile scene um so it was a, a statement no <laughs> we we do we talk about it stop saying we don't stop saying oh if only a girl would ever say something about a comic book it's boring it's silly it's happening um and we developed that website into a magazine essentially a magazine site full of critical writing reviews features um interviews things like that um around the features editorial for I think six years mm. then I was editor-in-chief there for a while um and then when I gave that up because that was all for free that was just work for for nothing volunteer stuff essentially but we, it was we were running it like a real concern like a real business essentially so it was taking up all of my time and eventually I just couldn't do it anymore right um it's it's still running like you should visit that website and, and read some stuff there's won several Eisner awards um but yeah, when I when I had finished there, I thought, what can I do next? Um, and it seemed quite obvious that the answer would be editorial, because when you look at a lot of comics, or at least for me, <laughs> of this particular critical bent of um, a certain amount of curiosity and process-based interest, um, when you have the same things to say about books quite often, like, I wish this had been more developed in this direction. I wish this dialogue was a little more original. I wish these relationships had been developed. I wish blah, blah, blah. You start to think, well, why can't I tell people this before it's finished, before it's published? Why shouldn't I let them know what isn't shiny as brightly as it could be so that they can make sure that it gets polished up so mm. that the people who are reading it are going to be satisfied in a way that I'm finding myself unsatisfied? So I put out the word, I'm going to do this. And some people were like, can you do it for me? And I never looked back. I love that. And as you you're too, actually, <laughs> yeah. So as you're sharing that, thanks for sharing that, that story. I learned some things I didn't, I didn't know about you, which is, which is awesome. <laughs> um, so you, I mean, I know you have this wonderful superpower of being able to critique and analyze and give feedback where it's thoughtful and it's helpful and like you said to help how do we in that process i'm thinking of learning in education where so often i shouldn't say so often that's not really fair but there are times where a kid might turn in an assignment and there's no feedback along the way you know and then at the end they get their paper back and it's all marked up you know i'm, I'm thinking maybe more my own education journey all with <laughs> all the red ink all over and it's like well yeah. that would be nice to know maybe before i turned in the final piece so that process over product i think resonates a lot in, in the education space mm. as as you are applying those skills and you're you're continuing to work in that field i want to expand a little bit about that arena and why do you feel that like it's not just creativity it's so much more you talk about the the, the power of communication but the visual arts the, the 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 power of storytelling the the ability to convey ideas maybe in new ways that resonates with people and your work is, is helping the people that are trying to do that become better at that but um why why that space why why is that so important um especially i would say in this day and age more than ever before and for a, probably a lot of reasons that 
I, I can probably find research to support maybe more opinion than anything. But, you know, um, you, you've gravitated to this space. You continue to work in that space. Why is, is this so important? And then we'll, we'll start to leverage in why it's important. We don't we don't lose sight of that. But I, I think at that that's a really important element that, that I want to unpack with you. Well, not not to be too dramatic, but um, not doing that kind of makes me want to die. Mm. I don't know how not to do it. Yeah. Without becoming intensely miserable, to the point of non-functionality, practically. Yeah. It's a hard question to answer because it's because from my perspective, and I don't mean this really as a criticism of the question. No, right. Um, but it, it's because, because it's kind of a stupid question. Yeah, right. Um, to 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 my like, I don't know how else to live. Yeah, I just don't. Uh, having well, I'm not good at other jobs, <laughs> um, and I don't know how to get them. Um, I I I've been unemployed, um, trying to to gain a normal job i don't know how to do it i i'm not successful at it um and i don't especially want to be um but it's not that i i wasn't trying out of disdain it's just i just don't know how to do it i don't know how to turn off the uh, my mind thinks like this on its own Hmm. Um, like people, it's fairly common, or it was fairly common, um, in the the twenty tens for people to um respond to, for example, film criticism with just turn off your brain and watch it, and I can't, I can't do that, um, which is probably related to ADHD. But I don't know that that is particularly meaningful in mm. the practical sense because it it's, it simply is the circumstance, it's the situation. I can't not think it's a shame they didn't develop that part of the plot. And I see what they were going for here, but it hasn't really come through. And with a few more developmental passes, it really could have. And that particular style of lighting is so gorgeous and it really brings out the themes of the scene like i i i, I can't not be this <laughs> right. so i don't understand trying i don't i don't get it yeah well i i love i mean i i, I love that answer uh, on, on a couple fronts one to me it is a stupid question in in the sense that <laughs> like because I feel like, and here, here's why that I would agree with that is I think so much of our day-to-day -day life, the things that we do, the things we gravitate to, whether it doesn't matter our job or occupation, hobbies, interests, I think we've taken for granted the power of the visuals of the storytelling, whether that is in a comic or a graphic novel, whether that's movies, TV shows, whether that's your short little TikToks that I see, like my own children glued to it. Like the, the power of visual storytelling is, is so prevalent in all aspects of our life that I think we've, we've, we don't always take time to appreciate the creative energy that comes with that. Um, and so with that is stacked upon there, then there also needs to be, I don't want to call it guardrails because that's not the right word, but like people that can offer critique and feedback and think through that. For example, I posted the other day on, on social media and, and, and maybe this will resonate a little bit where like I posed, there are times where I watch TV shows or movies, not because I necessarily want to watch a TV show or a movie, but I'm more excited about the podcast people that I like to listen to, to hear their commentary, their theories, their critiques, and they help me see things in shows, in movies, which then I think translate to helping me see the world in ways that like, I was like, oh, I didn't even pay attention to this little tiny detail. And now mm -hmm. I find myself looking for those and not just in shows, but in life and appreciating different kind of aspects. So I'm kind of rambling here, but I, I guess what I'm trying no, to do is like, 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 I agree with you. And I think part of that is coming back to kind of what I wanted to bring out through uh, the question is like, 
that we don't lose sight of that. Like, because I think so much of it does go underappreciated. We, we don't always appreciate the energy it takes to create something to put out into the world. We also don't always, we overlook what it takes to be able to look at that and give feedback and, and be able to engage that. That's what helps move the mediums forward. Um, you know, and, and that to me is the exciting element of, of, of living. Like you can't just be looking yeah. at spreadsheets all the time or whatever <laughs> your, your job might be. Like there's, there's more to life than that. Yeah. The, um, something that I think is very easy to, um, I suppose, forget or just not, not notice or realize is, um, is it, it's sort of immutable is um you have to do something with your time like we are alive for as long as we're alive but while we're alive we're alive all the time um and the more things that are automated the more time that leaves over and like it is nice to not have to do manual labor all the time if you are lucky enough not to have to do manual labor all the time but while you're not doing whatever thing you don't want to do you're doing something else because you're still existing like if for example uh, like a silly a silly example if you um get your sibling to do the washing up for you even though it's your chore what are you doing in the time that they are washing up it's Mm. something like even if it's nothing even if it's just sitting with your feet up that is what you're doing and there's a sort of essentially endless quality to that state because until you die you're doing something all the time and boredom is a real thing it does afflict us it can um it doesn't have to but if you don't do anything ever it will Mm. so if you can find diverting things to do or think, or look at, if you can find something to stimulate you while you are in that constant state of existence, then it will be nicer. You will have a nicer time. Um, If you just sit in a very boring room, thinking about nothing, do you want to be doing that? (laughs) Like, do you forever, (laughs) forever? If, it's, it's scary to do things badly. It absolutely is. But it's more interesting than not, than doing nothing, than than sitting and waiting for someone else to do it for you, sitting and waiting for someone else to do it perfectly. There's just, there's always you experiencing the passage of time. Mm. And making that fun by, by giving yourself things to develop, whether it be practically, like by drawing or doodling or writing things down or even like developing a spreadsheet of things that you are particularly interested in. Or if it's just mental, like you're just thinking, what could my character do next? What would someone like that do in a situation like this? It's more interesting than not. It's more interesting than just looking at a spot on the wall. Um, I think that because we are alive, we may as well enjoy it. Uh. And I think it's quite easy <laughs> if you let yourself. If you let yourself enjoy it, that's just better, isn't it? It is. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And sometimes I feel, I mean, I've used this word a lot in a lot of the recent podcasts I've been recording, but the word's permission. And so much of us we don't give ourselves permission in this case maybe to enjoy life and have fun we get yeah. so caught up in work and that could be easy where you can work 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 i was actually just messaging a friend and they've been putting in some crazy hours and then i said you know what you need to to at you know 5 p.m or whatever the time it was that i referenced you need to be done because guess yeah. what you could work literally through the night and you know what the next day, you know what's going to be there? Work. Or <laughs> you could turn off and that work will still be there tomorrow. And yeah. life in the society and everything will move on. Now, don't get me wrong. There are there are times and places of deadlines and certain things that do require extra effort. But we can get caught up in that. We can get caught up in things that the busyness is what a lot of what I've been reading about to maybe avoid or 
you know, we don't, maybe we don't even know what that looks like to, to, to enjoy. Like we don't, do we know ourselves? So we're getting real meta here, which is, uh, always seems to happen when I, when I chat with you, but I think it's, it's so spot on. I think as you're, as you're talking through that, I'm like, how many of us just don't give ourselves permission to just go enjoy and go have fun? Why not go to the art gallery? Why not go to a movie? Why not take a walk? Why, why not? Like that's because yeah. like you said, you know, we're only alive while we're alive. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and tomorrow is, 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 is definitely not ever promised. It's, it's very, um, it is moralized. Like it, it's, a lot of the time I think that we don't do this we don't give ourselves permission because we don't feel that we have permission from society at large um especially I think well perhaps not but perhaps especially if we have a religious background or if we have a particular like some type for example people talk about the British stiff stiff upper lip Mm. for example um and the to lesser or greater extent there's there's truth in it the idea that um to not complain is good is moral is correct um to just get on with things good moral correct um and it's very subconscious it's very it it insinuates itself and you don't notice um unless you check am i disallowing myself a completely harmless pleasure like getting a cup of coffee or sitting on the grass with my bare feet or um having a stroll down to see my favorite flower while it's out um just because i haven't thought about my assumption of morality and my assumption of morality is telling me that i must prioritize my work day over 15 seconds walking to see the flower Mm. or i must prioritize making dinner for my husband um over making like a nice drink for myself so that i feel happy before i begin or um like it's just it's very very easy to forget that there are all kinds of messages and um very subtle communications that we pick up all the time um, if we don't take care to notice on purpose and to do sort of an internal checklist, like, am I bumming myself out just because I've forgotten to stop? It really does happen very, very easily. Um, but I think that if there's one responsibility that a human being has, it's to keep themselves as, um, I'm trying to think of a word that, that doesn't over-moralize, but um, just to keep your life as non-depressing, I guess, as possible. If you have a choice, make the one that's nicer for you, as long as it's not, you know, stabbing someone. (laughs) Why would it be? Why would it be? Like, it's it's tricky in in discussions like this to to sound um, casual and to have the the confidence that a listener won't over extrapolate sure like I, I i would like to just say take it easy and have a nice time without assuming that someone may um imagine that that means run amok and right. throw mud in someone's eyes right. it doesn't obviously <laughs> right but subliminal communication all the time you know be suspicious, watch out, discourse, yada yada. It's tiresome. So yeah, just have a nice time. Decide to have a nice time and take care of yourself. It's tricky to start with, but it's it's very useful. <laughs> yeah. It's very yeah. useful to living. It is. No, I think you're I think you're spot on and, and you're right, you know, like when we are kind of having this conversation, it kind of feels like into the void where anybody can take the words in any direction, you know, but I think you're so you're right. I mean, even this week, my I kind of like weekly motto has been spending lots of stuff happening at the time of this recording with my job and just things in general. And I've just been the phrase of like, like, let go. And the focus has been more on just not like let go, who cares, don't care about anything, but the idea of like, what are the things that I can control? And let's focus on controlling those and doing the things that yeah. will help me feel better. Doesn't really necessarily, necessarily mean I'm going to feel happier but I'm going to feel just better about who I am. And so like this week I just been taking time and it has to be, I mean, I, this, this is me. Like I have to like 
put my 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 actions where, where my words are like i have to like i've been dedicating time where like i go in the morning and i've been going down to the local comic shop just to try to build some just other routines and i've been i've been like buying tangible yeah. comics because i mean people that I can't see but if I have my phone like I have I subscribe to some like the Marvel and the DC and and, and Shonen and those things but I was like but my phone keeps going off so I'm not really ever really immersing in a story and so like I want to be unplugged and so uh, now I'm like okay I'm gonna read you know like three comics a day just to build a habit where I'm sitting yeah. no devices and I love it and it's taken time because I also feel like I should be checking my phone and I'm like why like it's it's nothing is that detrimental and so um but it's just building that that space and and, and capacity yeah. and the habit right like i can i can sit Absolutely. here this is this is going to take 20 minutes this is not going to take endless hours i can still be responsible parents and professional and all the things but i can do this and i love yeah. it. i love i love the paper in my hands and i i'm getting to that space but it, at first it's like boy this is this is a sign that it's a problem that i i feel like i'm anxious that i'm not you know i, I yeah. that like my phone isn't buzzing or whatever the thing might be it's, it's just yeah. a, a really fascinating kind of i don't know experiment that i'm trying to run to like to kind of recalibrate back to like do the things you enjoy um yeah I'm I'm in I'm in my own way. Like I'm not I can't I'm not blaming <laughs> yes, people. I'm exactly. saying, like, I am yeah. literally the the barrier that's keeping me from doing some of that. <laughs> the um I read um a newsletter from my friend Cecilia O'Mara the other day. And I want to read a little bit of that because it's actually really relevant to what we're talking about. Um she's talking about the book um The New Me by Hallie Butler, which she didn't like. Um but she says, what stands out the most to me in my memory of the new me, where she describes the grubby brown towels in her apartment, which she hates but hasn't replaced. And when I think about it now, I think, yes, the towels are actually the problem. This is the best line. You will never gain control of your life until you act to control your life. And the very first thing she could do is replace the brown towels. Mm. It's completely true. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've found the same thing. Um, and it's real, like it's real. It really does happen that way. If you don't, if you abdicate responsibility to yourself, who is going to catch you? No one. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so true. And I think all, all of us could relate to the brown towel, right? Like we all, <laughs> I think we all probably have our own version of a brown towel, you know, in our, in our own space. Just as you think through that. Yeah. It's, Again, it's those details, right? It's the things that maybe we're yeah. we're, we're not noticing or, or 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 looking at, or um, intentionally or maybe subconsciously ignoring, because uh, it's just kind of like an onion peeling back the layers um, as we go through. So, gosh, this is so good. So, as as we think about this, I'm th going back then to the idea of storytelling, enjoying life, you love critiquing and editing and giving feedback to, to comics and graphic novels things of that nature not to go through all the elements but i am curious for people who maybe don't do that um or maybe haven't thought about that and not that it has to necessarily be and i'm thinking for the listener you have to be like go buy a comic to do these things but i am curious just as perspective like as we watch tv shows or movies that's probably where most people are you know as as you're looking through that with that lens of yours that you love that you said you know you almost can't i can't turn off and it it, it it's your dopamine hit you know how do you because yeah. you have such a i mean this conversation is proof of that um such a, a awesome perspective of of seeing things and analyzing things what's kind of your your process as, as you're going through those things um as as you're looking at you know someone gives you their work that they're doing you know and the reason i'm asking this is it could we could the listener i'm going to challenge you then to kind of whatever here is it to tweak it and remix it and and, and apply it to your own kind of practice uh, or mm -hmm. life or entertainment or you know not you have to do it all the time but whatever your 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 mode of medium is but for you you're looking through that um you know what's some of like the questions or pondering the things that you have well well, I know that's I will... really general for probably for some very specific tasks. So no, I, know um, I have an ebook actually um, called. I think I I can't remember the title. <laughs> I think it's called <laughs> How to Be a Comics Critic mm. um, because there's always talk about whether or not people are doing it right or whether or not people know how to do it and blah blah blah. And it, it's silly. Um, 
but because some people don't feel that they know how to do it, I made an ebook um, taking you through the essential steps. But I can summarize it because it's essentially just pay attention to what you notice. Mm. Um, once you notice what you notice, you can ask yourself, what do I think about that? What does it mean? What might it mean? Um, how does it relate to other things that I've noticed about it or that I know about it? Um, like, okay, give me give me an example of the thing. Like a piece of media. Let's go with let's just go with like a like a general like Spider Man comic. How about that? Okay. So, so yeah, so here be here your scenario. And we can clean this this little brainstorm piece out. So sure. if I present so... you like at the time of this recording, I know that tomorrow, uh, the next issue of one of my Spider-Man series is is, is going to be on the rack or in my pull list, I should say. Um, you know, if I wanted to take a look through that and kind of lend that that eye that you put into the work, you know, what would be some things that I would I should be paying attention to to notice or wonder about? Okay, so Spider-Man, first of all. What does he wear? I would I would look at the book and I would ask myself, what is the main character wearing? Mm. And half the time it's probably going to be his costume. So I would say, what about the costume tells me something about the person um, or his experience? For example, Spider-Man's costume is always absolutely skin tight. Mm. Why is it? Because he's always swinging around. It's to reduce friction. Um, it's to reduce the possibility he might be caught on a flagpole or something. Um, and it's to allow us to have an uninhibited uh, view of his gymnastic nonsense. Um, so you could look at what colors are used and how those make you feel. You could look at exactly what kind of gymnastic nonsense he's doing and how that makes you feel. You could look at how the artist of that particular issue is drawing the costume on his body, how many of the contours of his body, what kind of body he has, how that's being represented, what you think that means about what Marvel as a whole thinks that um, the idea of people who read Spider-Man expect or allow um in regards to um how naked he looks essentially um because for example my partner has been reading spider-man recently and it goes backwards and forwards um with the artist which parts of spider-man's body are most clearly outlined which angles we're seeing spider-man from and that tells you something about what that artist thinks is important in the representation of a human body and the representation of a human body that is also Peter Parker um, and what kind of person he is and how his life as a person who wears street clothes intersects with his life as a person who wears a skin tight costume. How does the costume differ to the things that he wears as a person on the street? Just keep looking and looking and seeing what you see and then thinking, what could that mean? Yeah. It's it's the same process over and over again. It's just yeah. what what is touching my brain? Why am I noticing it? Does it intrigue me further? Does it relate to anything else? It's just yeah. a, a, a like it's basically like Lego. Yeah. It is. It really is. And as you're talking, it just makes me think about is the more I'm I've been getting to these spaces, I'm starting to figure out I can kinda I'm not gonna give myself too much street cred here like notice like <laughs> the writers i can start to kind of pick out like writing styles and, and yeah. art styles and, and the and the colorists like the different jobs that go in there and i'm starting to kind of figure out which ones i like more than the others mm. and, but now the question is you're talking for me is i need i, I want to think more about like why like why do certain styles resonate you know like the spider-man story is just the story kind of is the same story over and over again, told a million <laughs> different angles, but like the way people depict him and the things is that, yeah. that's, an, that's, a, that's something an interesting with Spider Man in particular. You mentioned um, writers, Spider Man uh, is known as a joker, right? A quipster, 
Yeah. So when you're reading different guys or people, I I don't know how many women have ever written Spider Man, but there must have been some, right? Um, I anyway, so. <laughs> pe- the various people, the various people who write Spider Man, the kinds of jokes they have him say, the kind of quips they make him give are going to vary. Some people will have it all be sarcasm. Some people will have it all be pop culture references. It varies. And that is, that's interesting. It Why is. does that writer like that kind of thing? Why does this person think Peter Parker is the kind of person who would know whatever piece of pop culture? Does it tell you about the character or does it tell you about the person writing the character? Mm. It varies, but both are interesting because they're both technically people. <laughs> yeah, that is. Oh, it's so fascinating. God, yeah, that's so good. Yeah, now I'm going to have to go through and think through the different series that I'm reading and, and kind of pull through that there. You it's know, endless fun. It is. It is. It's now I'm, yeah, I'm going to have to, I need to go back in my in my stack and start to flip through <laughs> and see, see what, I, what I didn't pay attention to the first time. Yeah. You know, which is, ah, it's so great. I love the idea of inquiry and wonder and um, you're, you're, you're definitely sparking that through this this conversation, and so you know, which is so funny. I want to be, I do want to be respectful of time. I could, gosh, talk to you forever, but this is so <laughs> fascinating because the way we queued up this podcast was really not anything that we have been talking about, which has been yeah. such a wonderful delight. But I think it does fit into something that I at least do want to, want to touch upon because I think it, yeah. it fits into this whole ecosystem, kind of full circle of, of what we have been talking about, this idea of noticing and wondering and humanity and what it means to live and all that stuff. But, you know, I when I, I had was, was pestering you behind the scenes on social media <laughs> to come on and do this show. Um, I have been posting and people know, like I do a lot of like AI image creation, things like that. And and you and I got into a, a, a just a good conversation. It was, you know, which was like, we just need to talk about this. And um, <laughs> because you can bring a voice that I, I can't, I, I, I you know, I, I know it from, from my lens of what I do as a nerdy guy that likes shiny tools. And I know <laughs> how to process implications of things that maybe we should think about in education. Um, but we we were talking about that idea of of AI and the impact it could have on the creative arts, whether that's comics, it could be any of the things. I mean, we've seen we've yeah. seen the, the the strikes in, in in Hollywood and what that means for for writers and creators and people in the room. Where all of a sudden, if they're they're just editing AI work, like all of a sudden we we, we lose a sense of that. So we're seeing this here and lots of court cases around just artists and musicians around the the work that they create to be put into this. So I love that this whole conversation is not on AI because that does get old. But I think the reality is that AI is forcing a lot of us to, in, in, in good ways, um, even though it's, it's murky and there's no clear answers, to kind of reassess what it means to be human. But in this case, there are threats and, and maybe some, some risks and things that not everybody is thinking about. So um, I wanted you to get a chance to, to kind of share some of that stuff of in terms of AI and the impact it could have on mm-hmm. industry or creatives and things of that nature, because you can offer a lens that maybe not all of us have, have thought through, which could help us notice some other small slash large <laughs> things going on that maybe mm-hmm. we should. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I will just, I'll start with a splash page, like your average Spider-Man comic. Uh, AI is bad. How's that? Um, and it's it's for it's it's it comes from a few different directions. Yeah. Um, first of all, and this isn't something I'm going to go into greatly because it's, I don't need to. Um, it's really bad for the environment. Yes. It takes a lot of processing power, like unreasonable amounts, and that not only takes up a lot of energy, um, but that energy has to come from somewhere, and it is ecologically damaging and does um, trouble the world's poor more than the world's rich so bad um that aside i suppose um it is being widely advertised as the solution to artists Mm. um it is being spoken of by many um of the evil side of the the tech boy fun having demographic as um you know anti-artist de- death um we we don't need stinky old artists anymore we don't have to respect them anymore we don't have to pay them anymore um and that's great is is the the uh 
<laughs> the the stance, which I think is quite horrible. Right. Um, because not only is that like obviously unpleasant, it's actively hostile. Um, it rejoices in the economic destruction of a creative industry and the um the income of people who have devoted their lives to art and to producing beautiful and interesting art pieces and need to fuel their human bodies by buying food and so on um like a com- i said this when we were talking about Facebook, but a company that can fire all of its artists and just use an engine to recycle their old work into slightly adjusted new versions will do that they right. are doing that um it's bad um Particularly because and the the reason that I brought it up to you specifically instead yeah. of just going on is you work in schools, you work with children, you invited me to help inspire upcoming generations to artistic and creative work. And it won't exist if it's not protected. It will be gone. There will have been, in economic terms, no point in doing that if art as an industry is allowed to collapse is mm. allowed to be attacked and actively reduced demolished denied by the people who want to make their money by using all of the existing art that has been done by real human artists and feeding it through a big weird machine to make new mosaics you can just do that by hand like that's allowed you can yeah. collage you can repurpose but if you let machine do it no one's having fun (laughs) no one's Mm. benefiting someone's losing their livelihood and no one is using their mind or their heart or their eyes or their brain they're just churning um so like in the third instance like i said earlier you while you are alive you have to do things you have to do something all the time and if it's never going to be art because it's not economically viable or because you are too insecure you feel you can't compete with the computer that is recycling other people's years of hard work and expertise if you're killing yourself you're denying your own fun joy creativity time um it just is very gruesome to me Mm. um like in the local newsletter i live in a village now um so we have a, a local newsletter and like local plays on at the hall and whatever. And there's a poster in some of the windows in the shops and also in the newsletter for a two man show. And the poster is done with AI. Um, it's like regurgitated clip art of a sexy Frankenstein. Um, and it's just incredibly sad to me that nobody was asked to have a go and draw Sexy mm-hmm. Frankenstein for this amateur dramatics. Like, why? Why not? Isn't it nicer? Isn't it more fun? If so, if everyone has a go, like, isn't the point here having a go to entertain people, mm. not just lurging out something stolen? Um, it's just, like, sad and gross. And I, I don't mean to, like... I'm sorry to say that because I know no. that you have enjoyed it. And I'm not saying that it, it's like I don't understand why it's enjoyable because there's a certain occult interest in like the unknown. Um, and in like some people enjoy getting stable diffusion to produce them an image and then like fixing it or adjusting it and so on. And, and like I understand that obviously because that is the editorial process. It's just, what's the point of doing the editorial process on something dead? Why not collaborate with someone who has done their best so far, then you help them, then they do better? That's good. That's nourishing. That's life. But not doing it, or doing it on something that can't respond, that can't care, that can't be interested or really think about the changes you're suggesting, it's pointless. Um... And, like, a slight tangent, but I promise it's related. (laughs) Um, One of my favourite directors, Albert Pune, was never particularly respected. He was 
in the latter half of his, of his career, very much known as a, a trash creator. Um, and in fact, in the last couple of decades of his life, maybe three, he had brain lesions. He was ill. He was dying. And his films suffered because of it. They're bizarre. They're strange. They don't make sense. They're not really in like professional average terms finished but they're still fascinating and they're still inspiring and they provoke enormous amounts of thought in me because they are messed up results of someone who has trouble mm. like his brain isn't fully braining but he's still doing it. He's still trying. He's still making things. He still has the confidence and the compassion and the kindness and the generosity to provide the world with these bizarre artifacts that have all the occult interest, all the like mysterious, that doesn't make sense. What could he have meant by that? Like everything that's fascinating in the bizarreness of AI exists in human output. It's just outside of the very commercial. Because the very commercial is carefully honed to be easy to understand and easy to apply and easy to enjoy. So, of course, it's not going to be quite as fascinating in quite the same way because the editorial process has made sure that rather than being strange, it's comprehensible hmm. as, as a value. And that's fine. It's just that if that's all you're seeing all of the time, then seeing very strange, very mysterious very confusing items may feel like a novelty and it doesn't have to because you can provide that novelty for yourself by seeking weird by seeking low budget or rubbish or um niche or cult like i just watched um the fifth corner um you said am i binging anything and i said no because i forgot that that would count. Um, but yeah, I just watched all f five or six issue um, episodes. Um, it's from 1992, I think. It's awful. It's the worst television show I've ever seen. It's genuinely very, very bad. Um, it wasn't even all aired. It was cancelled after two or three episodes and they made more. But they were just like, no, it's not worth it. We're not putting this on the television. And they were right. It's dreadful. But because it's dreadful and because it's so obviously not ready for the television, for the commercial sphere. It's fascinating because you don't usually get to see that kind of thing mm. because they usually rescue it in time and make it better or just throw it away. But being able to see this this discarded item, like pick things off the rubbish heap, provides that same kind of interest. It's just yeah. it does it with real human output and real trying and effort and attempts. Like Even though they, they technically aren't good enough, they're providing me with enormous value because I can see what they were trying to do and why they didn't manage to do it. And I can see the interesting ideas they did have that just never really got fully born. And anyone can do this. Like, it's genuinely not hard. It's just that most people don't get told that they should or can do it. And so it doesn't occur because why should it? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm, I'm saying now, go and find some rubbish and have a look at it, because it could be very interesting. It won't all be, but some of it will, if you allow it to be, if you look for the value, if you look for the freaks, they are there, honestly, they truly are. Freaks are everywhere, and they're great. <laughs> well, I think you've, thank you for that incredible answer. It, it, it reminds me whether it's perfectly packaged by Hollywood and blockbuster films i think what you just kind of captured there is the idea of the human spirit right working through obstacles yeah. challenges setbacks to find some sort of triumphant ending and not everything ends in the hollywood way where there is you yeah. know we're, we're the number one we're, we're, we're the prize boxer if we're you know we're rocky or whatever it might be <laughs> but those elements are what we're all grappling with and uh, it's 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 so spot on. I mean, I'm looking at it through as you as you were talking, and like I, I was I was listening to a podcast. I was um, it was it was <laughs> Joe Rogan, which people can take him 18 million ways, but he was talking about Dave Chappelle's process as a, as a comedian, and 
how he has, you know, the huge big blockbusters on Netflix and everyone, a household name if you're into comedy. But he says what people don't know is he works his craft all the time and he flies all over and just shows mm-hmm. up at random comedy places. And when the show is over, he'll ask to go on stage, which we've ever left. And, and he, he's working on his ideas because they're not always good. True. We only see, right, the kind of shiny package Netflix special that, that just lands, you know, or if you're a fan of him, it lands and you enjoy that hour. But what people don't see and what Joe Rogan was talking about is like the, the countless pursuits and hours and dedication where when you are in that limelight, you can't be necessarily as, as freewheeling. So you have to do it in different ways. And that's kind of how he does it. And mm-hmm. I was thinking about, we'll just keep coming back to comics, like, I've been exploring more independent comics and some of the podcasts I've been listening to have talked about how there's kind of been a resurgence outside of like the Marvel DC yeah. heavy hitters, like some of these independents and the, the beauty of like, that's where new ideas come from. Like we yeah. know, I mean, we can take Spider-Man. I love them. I, I already know how every series is going to end, right? They're not going to like venture too far off the path with what, spider-man peter parker is gonna do i'm mm-hmm. still gonna read it because there's comfort in the journey right like there's comfort yeah. i know what i'm gonna get each page uh, but the independent piece pushes the thinking it pushes the art it pushes what is maybe capable on a page and i think about out of covid when every single media company came out with their own streaming platform and all of a sudden you didn't know which one to subscribe to and now it's mm-hmm. cluttered and it's it's messy and, and for me it's it's frustrating. And so now they're all going to kind of be a conglomerate, but someone came up was talking about the idea, like, but that's when so many new ideas were able to be shared. People were, they're all trying to pitch to be the best, but now Mm -hmm. there's shows that had you just had cable or if it's just Hulu or if it's just Disney, they're never going to make the platform. They're never going to make the recipe, but because there's so many of them, people are getting opportunities to share stories and medium and art, you know, and it would just be, just countless examples as, as you've kind of talked about this so others there's, there's something to all of that and even getting to ai like my hope that i'll get off my my soapbox here is that with ai as i dabble in it or i don't dabble in it, i'm in it quite a bit um what i'm seeing is that people my hope out of ai is people are going to start to get so saturated in this ai recyclable content the writing the blog posts the art the video it's all gonna and that people are gonna start to go i miss i miss the human side i miss the sloppy i miss the hand hand illustrated uh frankenstein promo for the two-man show <laughs> i miss you know what i mean like i miss the things i miss um and i think it'll i think there'll, there'll be a resurgence i think we all gotta kind of just sit tight here i hope i mean that's my my thing that through all this it's kind of like a broken mirror complex we look back at ourselves as humanity and go boy there's some things we overlooked and there's some things that we've got to clean up and and maybe nothing else appreciates and so um that's my hope with all the things even though i dabble in it uh quite a bit but i start to see it um like all the images look the same all the graphics mm-hmm. and i mean i'm and i'm calling myself out because i you can go on my website and you can see it image ai image stuff everywhere so i am i am calling myself out here but i think it'll get i think it'll get it'll just be like oh well i gotta do something different because now everybody's doing it right you know and so i think there's there's a hope a a resurgence a renaissance of uh humanity at the the end of this well i think that you have a lovely optimism but i would perhaps challenge you um, to see AI as your brown towels. Mm. Mm. Get out the scissors, <laughs> Aaron. Get out the scissors and some old magazines. Cut and paste. Yeah. Practical image rearrangement. It's a good time, I promise. It you, is. Like, seriously, the same things that, that, like, the same results, comparable results, but a much more don't laugh spiritual process yeah 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 no i, I want to I mean, see i, I want to see what you do challenge that, accepted. that's a genuine yeah. challenge i used to make uh like a monthly vision board um yeah and i would just go to the the bookstore and just buy at random sometimes i have my kids go and be like you just pick out three four random magazines and then that's what i would use to kind of figure that out so, fantastic um, 
I'll, I'll bust out my my scissors and uh, yes. maybe make a trip to the, the. Well, I don't even know if I even have bookstores around me anymore. I have to go find a bookstore. But uh, uh, but yeah, I'm not cutting comics. I'm going to tell you that I'm not going <laughs> to cut my comics. But I will they're cut no, up some. They're magazines. never going to be worth a million. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, you know, yeah. Well, Claire, I am already, gosh, way over time here chatting with you. It is always such a a deep profound pleasure to to speak with you Likewise. even if i get to sit on the sidelines of a classroom and and watch you work <laughs> working magic when bring these same kind of ideas to to the level of kids as we're working through their own kind of self-identity and stuff to uh this this conversation i think is going to give lots of i think excellent thought for people to think about their own practice see in the world what their brown towel is and <laughs> you know maybe that's the challenge everybody listening let's see uh your own your own vulnerability and create something by hand and, and, and share yeah. it to wherever you come across this podcast. And so Claire, this has been so good, so powerful, so thought provoking for people that want to learn more about you, um, follow your journey, just kind of figure out what that is. We'll get all the links in the show notes. I know we'll get links to the, you mentioned the ebook and some different things like that, but you know, I always like to end someone's sitting at a red light and wants to know more about Claire, you know, where's the, the best place for them to go? Clanapia.com. Simple. Hey, that's about as easy as it can be. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. This has just been thank absolutely you. wonderful and such a delight. And uh, I always appreciate your authenticity and uh, way of seeing the world. So thank you. Thank you. I've had a good time. It's, it's nice to be allowed to just run my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Woke up at six o'clock in the morning, chilling with coffee mugs, me and coffee chugs, talking education all across the nation, pushing boundaries, thinking innovation. Chaos.